From Bishop Ireton High School, it's Real World Wednesdays, a show featuring alumni and friends of the school for the Cardinal community and beyond. I'm Ryan Fannin, Associate Director of Advancement and a member of the BI class of 1989. And on the show today, C.J. Howard, architect and full-time professor at the Catholic University of America, and Jason Lewis, senior construction manager for the Diocese of Arlington, as they talk about the plan to transform the St. Francis de Sales Chapel at Bishop Ireton. The St. Francis de Sales Chapel was first opened and dedicated in 1967. Since then, it's remained largely unchanged. Sure, it's seen minor modifications, painting and the addition of sacred art throughout, for example, but for the most part, it's nearly exactly the same as it was five decades ago. From the outside of the school, you might have trouble identifying where the chapel actually is. As it is now, it blends in with the rest of the school building. Its only distinguishing factor is a sign that reads St. Francis de Sales Chapel. The chapel's lack of prominence was one of the many reasons a full-scale renovation was considered. A Catholic school should have its chapel as front and center as possible. It is, after all, the spiritual center of the school. Though plans for a new and improved chapel were floated nearly a decade ago, the project gained steam in 2020. Head of school Kathleen McNutt and chaplain Father Noah Mori worked closely with the Diocese of Arlington and Bishop Burbage to begin work on the project, which would be a renovation of the current space from top to bottom. With the diocese on board, Jason Lewis, senior construction manager for the Diocese of Arlington, became heavily involved. His background in architecture and his extensive work throughout the diocese on previous projects gave him a strong foundation for his work on this project. When it was time to select an architect, BI and the diocese did a thorough vetting process. Ultimately, they selected C.J. Howard. C.J., who owns his own architectural firm and is a full-time professor at the Catholic University of America, seemed uniquely suited to the job. Not only were his designs well received, he's also a member of the Diocese of Arlington and an Alexandria resident. So how did CJ come to architecture in the first place? It wasn't something he knew a lot about as a child, but rather something that came to him as he put the pieces of his interests and talents together at Notre Dame during his college days. It wasn't uh, very direct early on. I didn't actually know what an architect was necessarily but I had inclinations with art and building at the same time. Of course, those two things come together pretty well when it comes to architecture. Well, actually it wasn't until college where I you know, had to make a decision about a major where I was like, yeah, this is, I think this uh, you know, matches up with my interests pretty well. So early on it was, it was the building of blocks, the, the loving of Legos, the drawing and uh, you know, imagining, you know, putting things together and, and making uh, a vision come true. Now you attended Notre Dame and uh, for undergrad and received your Bachelor of Architecture. You then returned to Notre Dame and earned your Master's of Architectural Design and Urbanism. Uh, can you talk a little bit more about your experience in those programs? Sure, yeah. Um, and, and with those two degrees, we're called the Double Domers, the Golden <laughs> Dome. The experience there was great. Uh, again, I, I didn't really know what I was getting myself into other than I knew I, knew I wanted to go to Notre Dame. Uh, I knew they had a good architecture program, uh, but what I didn't know is it's pretty unique in that they they are really the only school that exclusively teaches traditional classical architecture. So that's what I learned, and I, I you know carried forward in my professional career, and have grown to love and appreciate. Uh, so there's the architecture side of that, which is you think about building or buildings, uh, and then the the broader um, sort of macro context is thinking about urban design, making whole cities. And so there's a way to traditionally uh, design cities. Uh, and all these things were um, really fascinating to me in college to really get some exposure to um, and, and you know, build on some of these lessons that I was learning. I'm curious as a bit of a follow-up talking about your alma mater. Did or does the impressive architecture on campus in South Bend, uh, something that influenced your architectural uh, style now? I think so, to some degree. What you would call or describe the architecture at Notre Dame's campus and many other campuses in the United States 
is collegiate Gothic, so that it is traditional. Primary language is, is Gothic. Um, I would also uh, cite, uh, going back to my early years, moving around. My dad was in the Army, and so we moved around, lived in countries like uh, Germany. Uh, we're seeing that architecture, that traditional context, I think, was very impactful as well. And I, I, that came back, you know, paired up well with what I was learning in that sort of a program. There's a quote on your website that I would love for you to elaborate on. And this is the one that I, I want to specifically get your take on. Architecture is a very complex art and needs the control of rich tradition but also must advance through innovative personal talent and intelligent application. Tell us about what that means to you. Uh, what it means to me is uh, ultimately uh, what um, is sort of a, an ideal for an architect to be well-rounded, to understand what you're doing, to understand that you're bringing all these disciplines together. And so you need to know all these things. And then you also bring in, in particular, sort of an artistic side to composing beautiful architecture. Uh, and it also talks to sort of practice and theory and being well-rounded there, thinking about good architecture, but then also being able to do it. Uh, so there's a, a balance there. Uh, and, then it, and then sort of finally is uh, the idea, the notion of uh, carrying something forward, so especially in traditional architecture, we're thinking about um, an advancement. A lot of people, I think, consider traditional architecture as sort of flat, and non-progressive, but inherently is trying to build on uh, something that came in the past. So knowing the past, building on that in intelligent and good and new and contemporary ways uh, is, a, is a fine art. Um, and that's definitely what I've grown to appreciate, uh, you know, from school to practice is how to insert my own self in the context of a continuum of architecture and architects that have come before and then uh, do something new with it. I think it necessarily needs to be a living tradition versus a dead one. You've worked steadily to build your own firm. Talk to us about that journey to get to where you are now. And, and we'll talk specifically about the BI renovation project in a few minutes. But up to that project, tell us a little bit about the kind of work you gravitate towards. So after graduating, I moved out here to the Washington, D.C. area. Uh, and again, uh, had this background in traditional classical architecture. So I found some firms here to, to do that in. Uh, had some really great experiences with a broad range of projects, uh, high quality firms and different types of projects. Um, and so I was doing that and really appreciating it. Um, and uh, honestly, a, a changing or a shifting of that uh, happened when I took on a teaching position at the Catholic University of America. Uh, with that, it, it made sense for me to leave the firm that I was working at, a uh, medium-sized firm in Washington, D.C., doing uh, church work, ecclesiastical, primarily Catholic church uh, projects. So I have that in my background, was definitely uh, appreciative of having that uh, in my, my experience. Uh, so when I took this teaching position, fortunately, uh, allowed me to then uh, go out on my own. Um, and I think I would have eventually gotten there, but it was an interesting sort of uh, launch pad for that to, to start my own work and, and do my own uh, projects. And, and again, trying to engage with this traditional background as well as uh, ecclesiastical work. So I'm, I'm really fortunate to be doing that now for this project. Before we talk, CJ, about the Bishop Ireton project, I want to turn to Jason now. And Jason, uh, you've had an impressive career, and I know you've also studied architecture before shifting to a more project management focus. Uh, can you talk about your upbringing and your initial interest in architecture? Like CJ, I think the sort of the building blocks for going on to study architecture really started early for me. In fact, in high school, I went to a what we call a comprehensive high school. So they taught all the trades. And somehow I naturally gravitated toward, towards the arts and also technical drawing. And once I started, especially technical drawing, something about it just, just caught my eye and my interest. And so from high school, I also went to a community college where I pursued building studies um, where, you know, we, we looked at all components and parts of the building and how it's supposed to work. And then after that, I eventually went to work before I actually went to college. So 
I went to work in the, uh, the government of St. Lucia's architectural office, um, where we built a lot of public projects, um, any and everything that you could think of, you know, schools and, and hospitals and office buildings, you name it, you know, that served the public. And so working in the office, headed by an architect at the time, it really opened my eye uh, to sort of the finer details of architecture and how the chief architect at the time kind of looked at projects, how he developed them. And so more than anything else, it really piqued my interest. Um, and so after a couple of years working, it was my turn. I was like, yes, I need to, I need to study architecture. Um, I need to get a dose of the full thing. And that's when I went, you know, went abroad, studied, got my first degree in architecture, and uh, after, after my first degree, my undergrad, I decided I wanted more um, because I really enjoyed it. And, and so I also pursued a master's degree in architecture. Um, and then after that, you know, went back to the office, um, continuing to design, having, having um, the responsibility of pretty much leading the design efforts in the office. I ended up at that time, you start thinking, yes, you, you definitely want to get some some of the management um, component of it as well. And then I ultimately went on to study project management as well at, at George Washington University. Yeah, elaborate on that, because after studying architecture, uh, what drew you specifically to that project management side? Was it all of the experiences you just shared with us, or what was it that brought you so much into focus with that? And, and maybe talk about some of your other experiences before you came to the Diocese of Arlington. After studying, after um, completing um, the master's degree in architecture, it gets to a point, I think, where you 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 kind of get to see the big picture, how to work with different people and, and different um, organizations in order to realize a project. And at the time as well, project management had really taken off. You, everybody was, that was the thing. Um, we're talking about, you know, late 90s, early 2000s. And so it was a good field to get into at the time because we realized that managing projects was not, it was not a, uh, not a fly by night, but sort of, yeah, anybody could do it. There was a science to it. And so I thought, yeah, I, I need to understand what the science is more than anything else. And so that's what really pushed me into, into pursuing a master's degree in, in um, project management. Now, after, after studying project management, I've, I went on to work with um, one of the largest, I guess, general contracting firms in the country, you know, in the, and, and they're headquartered here in the D.C. area, which is Clark, um, worked with them for quite some time um, and gained a lot of experience on that end. Um, you can imagine Clark does everything under the sun and they're very, you know, well recognized for, for the work, the quality of work that they do. So having spent some time there, I, I had my, my, my daughter, which is, you know, my, my second child during the, the, the time I was working on the African American Museum in DC. And it, it, it had become a bit of a, you know, time and, and, and the, the, the time I needed to focus on family was really a challenge. And I decided, you know what, I just needed to take a break. I need to take a break here. Let me focus on family and then I'll get back in. But, you know, after spending time, you know, taking some time off, you know, with the family, I decided, you know what, maybe I needed to go on the owner side of things um, because, you know, you have the general contractor and then you have the owner slash developer. And so and the opportunity came up where a friend who was working at the diocese at the time was about to leave. And he said to me, hey there's an opportunity at the Diocese of Arlington if you're interested. And I said to him, absolutely, very interested in it. And so went over, interviewed, and uh, here I am today, almost nine years later. That leads perfectly into what I want to talk about next, because you've been part of some massive projects since you've been with the diocese, as you said, almost a decade now, including Paul VI new campus and the construction of Bishop Ireton's new 40,000 square foot academic building where we sit right now. Um, what has been the most rewarding aspect of working with the diocese and some of these amazing projects? The most rewarding 
I would say, is the ability to build God's kingdom. That's how I see it. And that's one of the things that really drew me to the Diocese of Arlington and doing that, that, that kind of work. In fact, even before studying architecture in my own parish, um, you know, back back in, uh, in the islands, you know, a pastor, a priest came up to me and said to me, I need to rebuild this church that we're in. And I had not studied architecture yet, but somehow he picked me and I did the drawings literally without, I, I was working in an architectural office, so I knew, I knew construction, I knew drawings, and I put it together. And I look back on that, on that moment, and I ask myself, wow, this is, it was almost like divine intervention at the time, because here I am, you know, decades later, and I'm in the middle of building churches and building schools. So it's really, um, you know, looking at, you know, politics and even the Bishop Ireton um, project and, and, and Bishop O'Connell as well, it's really rewarding. It is something that's really fulfilling to see these projects um, come to fruition, being a part of it, giving students and parishes and schools um, spaces that they can grow both academically and spiritually. And I really enjoy doing that. And in fact, I don't know of anything more rewarding. And I tell people who ask me that all the time, I tell them that is one of the most rewarding things that I have, have, have done and I've experienced. And I, I don't know after this whether or not I'll do anything else, to be honest, <laughs> because I have, it's almost I've found my niche. I've found my, 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 the area that, that, that I really love. Well, just speaking with both of you all today, your passion just comes through so clear about how this is so much more than work. It's it's something that is a part of your life mission, and that's that's amazing in its own right. And that brings us to a great opportunity here to talk about the current project, uh, the St. Francis of Sales Chapel renovation project here at Bishop Ireton, which as of now has begun the initial construction phase. And uh, CJ, when you first heard about uh, the project, what was it that drew you to submit an RFP? And, and I know you have a background being a member in the diocese, so I wonder if that played a role as well with your familiarity with the Diocese of Arlington. Oh, absolutely. Uh, familiarity from uh, being in the parish, also uh, proximity. I, I live not too far away, and so I, I you know, things are uh, are known in the, in the neighborhood, and I was aware, made aware of the project, and and thought that uh, a whole lot of things aligned with respect to my background and my expertise and what the uh, vision was calling for in terms of this new chapel. So, uh, yeah, to me it was a no-brainer just to submit uh, and see what happens. Uh, and as I talked about a little bit earlier. Uh, at that moment, uh, I guess that would be like two years ago, maybe <laughs> something like that. Tough to keep track, but uh, that's about the time I was beginning to uh, bolster my own firm and, and sort of grow it uh, as my own uh, sole proprietorship. So um, to me, it was perfect sort of providential alignment and, and even more providential that I was selected for the job. So once you were hired as the architect, tell us about the inspiration for the project. What were some of the challenges and what excited you the most early on? Sure. Uh, well, I'm certainly excited by a challenge um, in, in any project. You, you, you kind of lay out the, what the problem is. And because we're problem solvers and we're creative, we're like, okay, let's, let's see what we can do here. So uh, yeah, the challenges are exciting in that respect. Uh, the challenge here was, one, that it's an existing building. It's not like we were going to raise the chapel. Um, uh, so we had to work with what was there. I had to work with that. Um, and that's both from a vision standpoint in terms of what it looks like, the aesthetic, uh, but also because it's an existing structure, we're not sure entirely what's going on. We have to uh, uh, do some uh, archaeology, so to speak, and, and see what you know, what's what, in terms, of, uh, primarily in terms of structure. Um, so that aspect, those two things were the most challenging. And you know, further down the road as we were developing the project, uh, things like the foundations were, uh, were something that came up in terms of will, will they be able to hold all this new stuff we're putting on top of it. Um, but then shifting to the aesthetics of it, um, the existing chapel itself you would call something uh, of an art deco uh, aesthetic. Uh, so it's a more of a modern um, language, I'll call it. 
Um, so whenever you have a project like that, you have to acknowledge it. You can't ignore it. So there are several choices you can make. You can kind of take that and expand on it with that same language, or you can try another direction. Um, but that obviously makes it a little more complicated in terms of how those two things engage. Um, so really for this project, and, and largely driven by the vision to have it have a more of a traditional language, um, we went in that direction. And then it was a matter of trying to make those two things uh, somehow compatible. When you come into a project that you aren't designing from scratch, and the way you describe it, it's a different type of project, do you find that uh, more challenging, less challenging, more interesting, less interesting? Give us a little feel for from where you sit, what that is like. Yeah, I, I think it's case by case, I would say that. Um, sometimes the challenge is too much. <laughs> You're like, well, maybe we should just start over. Um, but in most cases, I find that it make, it, it's that, that challenge results in a more rich project. It pushes me to be more creative. It acknowledges the fact that something exists and has value to it. Um, so it's really exciting to me. Uh, to build upon something and sort of harness the uniqueness of whatever it is that you're designing uh, and try to amplify the good, right, and, and push it in a direction. Like I said, there's, there's um, uh, a sense of in the tradition of building upon things and that there's a, a, a humanity to that. Uh, so you admit that and then uh, using your skill and creativity, try to um, advance that forward in a successful way. Jason, I want to ask you a little bit about once that initial architecture piece was complete, um, I imagine this is where you really come into the picture. I know you're always along the way, of course, so involved um, from the beginning. But tell us a little bit about your role as a project moves from concept to execution. As soon as we've, you know, hired the architect, and in that case, you know, CJ, um, was the, the successful, you know, firm. We sit down um, as, as a diocese, and that includes, you know, Bishop Ireton as well, to kind of ensure that the, the language, the design is, is in keeping with, with what the, the diocese requires. Because all of these projects go through a process. You get a design, and I can tell you, the chapels are very special within the Diocese of Arlington because the bishop takes very special interest in these chapels. Like, we can build schools and classrooms. Yes, the bishop has to come and bless it and everything else. But as you understand, the chapel is sort of the spiritual center of the school. And so everything that happens within that space holds a special place, you know, near and dear to the bishop. So he has eyes on it. He has fingers on it whether it's him, whether it's Father Weston, um, so that they can make sure that everything that's happening as the designs develop, that it really speaks and it meets the requirements um, of, of the diocese and, of course, the bishop. So as, 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 the, as the drawings develop, we have meetings, we look at it. You know, the head of school will, will share some of those designs, some of those drawings with the bishop and his office, and then we'll sort of, you know, we'll get the thumbs up we do have to go through a building commission process where you have priests and lay people sitting on a committee that looks at the design as well, look at the cost and make sure that the costs are aligned to, to the design um, and so that nothing is, is, is sort of out of whack there. Um, and so that process is well established and we sort of follow that process until or upon or until we are at a place that yes, we can proceed, and, and that's why we are where we are today. So it's a, it's a very rigorous process that we go through um, from the diocese side of things so that we can get projects built the right way. Well, you guys today have been able to give us this picture of all of this that takes place to get to even this moment where we are now, this exciting part of where the construction phase of the project really gets underway. And talk about the Diocese of Arlington and how they remain involved going forward from here from a daily and weekly basis? As soon as we have a final design, we'll go to the, the jurisdictions for approval. And as we, we get the approval, the diocese is responsible for contracting a general contractor to build the project. 
So what we'll do, we'll put the drawings out to bid. We'll get um, bids from, from interested parties. We will select a successful bidder. And once we issue a contract to that person, that's where the construction management, the project management side of things come in. And that's where, you know, the diocese really sort of really kicks in from the Office of, of, of Planning, Construction and Facilities, where we now look at the project, ensure that, you know, we are building the project according to, to specs and, and the documents and the requirements of the jurisdictions. And we can do that, you know, a couple of ways. We can have a lot of oversight at the diocese um, or... And for the most part, that's what we do. We do hire consultants to help us, you know, manage the various aspects and the various components of the project. So the, the diocese is responsible sort of the, for the overall management of the project, whether, again, internally sometimes, depending on the size of the project, or when we have those bigger projects, we have to hire additional consultants to help us manage these projects. And as this project, like any other, progresses, over the next couple of months, we are doing just that. We'll have a couple of consultants on board with us. And then we at the diocese get to manage all these, these uh, consultants and these parties so that we get the project that the, the, the school, Bishop Ireton, and the diocese wants. I'm fortunate enough to work very close, uh, just about 20 feet away from our head of school, Kathleen McNutt's office. And I, if I heard it once, I heard it a million times. I've got a, a really big meeting today with CJ. I have a big meeting today with Jason and the diocese. Um, just talk about that importance of having a head of school um, with leadership and collaboration and how critical that is to the success of these kind of projects. That's what you want. On these projects, you need almost somebody to quarterback, not just the construction process, but the overall process. Because as head of school, I mean, she's responsible for ensuring that the project comes to fruition. Okay, so from the fundraising part, making sure we have the money, convincing, I'll use the word convincing the diocese that it is a feasible project. That is really the head of school or the pastor's job. And so... You know, Kathleen has done a tremendous job, I can tell you, getting this project and this process to where it is today. And if something's not moving, you know, you'll be sure to hear from Kathleen. Hey, when, when are we signing a contract? When are we sending this out? So you know that you have somebody who is going to, 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 to push and make sure that everything happens in a timely manner. And again, like I said, that's what you want um, because... These projects can sometimes, you know, drag along a little bit, just depends on, you know, where you are. But when you have somebody who's always, you know, pushing and, and, and making sure that you follow up on things, it, it definitely helps get the projects moving. And that's what we have here. To close out, I want to talk big picture here, if we could. And CJ, uh, I'll begin with you on this question. What in your view and from an architectural perspective is the importance of a project like this for a Catholic high school? Yeah, well, it's very profound. Um, if at, at the end of the day, it's, uh, it's about forming uh, young people. And so, uh, you know, as the, the church would profess, you know, that, that it's uh, engaging with the Catholic faith and that, that that be manifest physically, you know, with, with a, some form of uh, 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 religious structure. So in this case, it's chapels and, and that each high school would have one. Uh, not only that they would have one just to sort of check a box, but that it would be truly uh, authentically the, the core, you know, the, the, the spirit of the school. That's, that's the hope, right? That you would want that to be uh, a source of uh, inspiration and a, and a source of uh, spiritual growth. Um, so, you know, on its face, it's, it, it's uh, sort of obviously significant to the campus. Um, and in this case, um, with the chapel here at Bishop Ireton, uh, there's a recognition that that more could be done with it, which inspired the project. Um, it already has a pretty good sort of uh, location on campus. If you want to talk just physically, it does have a, a prominence in terms of location being up front, um, but it doesn't really reach out from the from the exterior uh, in terms of trying to uh, uh, arrest somebody's attention and then ideally you know, bring somebody in to, to do some good work, you know, in terms of soul building. Um, so that's 
that's to me um, at the heart of it um, that a project like this could touch uh, students and and make them uh, holier, better people. Uh, that's a that's a pretty high order. I thought this said it very well, and it was. A, a Backing what you just said, Bishop Ireton will have a visible and beautiful spiritual centerpiece for the school and its community. And the way it complements the project of the 40,000 square foot, it really gives the campus something that is, is just a beautiful completion to this project that ended several years ago. When Kathleen Fuss called me and said, Jason, I want to do something with this chapel. And this is something that we had talked about because... I worked on, on the PVI project, so we built a new chapel. I had just completed the Bishop O'Connell project as well. We built a new chapel there. John Paul the Great was built, I don't know, a decade ago. It has a really nice chapel that is very visible. The only missing piece in the four high schools was Bishop Ireton. And, you know, Kathleen came at the end of our the 40,000 square foot building. So she got a piece of that, and now she, she said, yes, that's the piece that will complement everything and put it all together, almost complete the campus. And that is so true. In fact, you drive along Duke Street, and you couldn't tell that this was a Catholic high school. So this project, and again, amazing design by CJ, really completes that. It really is the sort of the crown on everything, because that's what you want. You want people to know that this is a Catholic high school that has a spiritual center, because our responsibility is not just to, to teach these kids and to develop them academically, but spiritually, it's huge for the, the, the church and the diocese. And I think putting that together, catching the eye and attention of people who pass by and drive by, I think is going to be so, so profound and so deep and I, and, and I can't wait for this chapel to be completed because, yes, it will be the, sort of the icing on the cake. That's Jason Lewis, Senior Construction Manager at the Diocese of Arlington, and C.J. Howard, architect and full-time professor at the Catholic University of America, who are set to make a major impact on Bishop Ireton with the reimagining of the St. Francis de Sales Chapel. I'm Ryan Fannin, and you've been listening to Bishop Ireton's Real World Wednesdays.